Hi, good morning, and welcome to Tea with Dr. G, powered by Verizon. I am Dr. Jermaine Smith-Baugh, President and CEO of the Urban League of Broward County here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And today I'm going to be discussing racial equity in leadership. And joining me is Michelle Robinson, Vice President for State Government Affairs with Verizon. Hi there, Michelle. Hello, Dr. G. Thank you so much for having me today. Oh, man, I am so thrilled to spend these few minutes with you. Um, we won't tell them all of our secrets, so we're going to go ahead and jump right on in, right? Just awesome to see you. So we're going to be talking about uh, racial equity and leadership. And clearly, you have spent um, a really significant part of your career with Verizon, so you know all about leadership. In the Harvard Business Review, it suggests that we are entering this age of corporate social justice. In the weeks following um, George Floyd's death, there seemed to be a flashpoint, what I referenced sometimes as a, an eruption of consciousness you know, across our nation, when many of our corporate leaders became much more vocal about racial injustice issues and much more attuned to the needs of black and brown communities. I want to know from your perspective, um, what do you think uh, about this time? And is this time different? And if so, why? Wow, that's a, that's a great question, Dr. G. Um, for me, yes, definitely. This time is different. And the reason for that, I think, really starts with our CEO and chairman of Verizon, Hans Vestberg, who very soon after George Floyd's tragic death, went on Verizon's Twitter handle, which is the handle we use to communicate with employees worldwide, 130,000 employees worldwide. But it's also there for the world to see as well. We don't, you know, it's not a private channel. Mm -hmm. And he made um, a very impactful statement that really just struck a chord with me. And I'd like to read a few sentences from that statement right now, if I could. Absolutely. The events unfolding across the country that are rooted in hate are contradictory with our beliefs as a company and leave me with a feeling of regret and sadness. Verizon is fiercely committed to diversity and inclusion across all spectrums because it makes us and the world better. I am hopeful that the rest of the country will come to understand that valuing everyone equally is the best way forward. We cannot commit to a brand purpose of moving the world forward unless we are committed to helping ensure we move it forward for everyone. Dr. G, I have never seen a CEO of a major corporation strike out a view and a position and an, on a, with a level of understanding that he did. And with that, with the, that talk he gave, which I just read to you a snippet, he also announced a $10 million grant mm -hmm. to the nation's preeminent and well-respected organizations with a track record working in this space to make things better. Of course, the National Urban League was top on that list. Um, but his talk really paved a path and gave air cover for are employee resource groups in Verizon. So we we call them, um, they're like affinity groups. There's an African-American group, there's a Hispanic group, a women group, a great gay, lesbian, trans group, and so on. But it gave them air cover to start hosting, particularly our African-American group called Gold, um, to start hosting conversations about race, racial equity, you know, equity and justice and beyond, inviting all employees to participate. Um, our HR leaders began making available tools and educational curriculum, TED Talks, Harvard Business Reviews, uh, you know, articles, so many things with professionals in the space. So we could start on a learning journey together in Verizon. And leaders and non-leaders alike who, who really hadn't really thought about this issue much, maybe because they didn't feel like it applied to them, started listening, Dr. Dr. Yeah, G, yeah. and began to be open to a new understanding and a new worldview around these issues. And in my own department, the legal organization, we began hosting conversations about racism, 
Dr. G, we're talking about racism at work in one of America's largest corporations. At a minimum, our African-American employees, but not just our African-American employees, others too, are now feeling heard at work. And I know for one, for me personally, I don't have to pretend that what's happening in the world in my community out there doesn't impact me at work. I don't have to put on that mask. I can come to work and be my authentic self and, and find it to be a safe place for these very difficult and frankly uncomfortable conversations. So for me, this is the very definition of diversity and inclusion. And so, yes, that's why I think this time is very different than ever before, Dr. G. You know, Michelle, you raised such um, really strong points. And the fact that it starts with leadership and that cover, that umbrella, you know, that you, you spoke to um, through you and your team, I had the opportunity to actually speak. Uh, at one of the bold, the African-American affinity groups, um, open conversations. And it was a tremendous opportunity for me to share my lived experience. And I think, you know, you've definitely outlined that this isn't uh, just a flashpoint for Verizon. That you all have been committed to anti-racist, anti-racism work and corporate activism, but this definitely has lit an even greater fire behind how we all can show up, right? In our respective places as whole beings, right? Not, you know, segmenting it. So with that, can you just share with the audience, definitely from your leadership perspective, the benefits of using a racial equity lens in creating a more equitable policies uh, for communities that have been historically marginalized? Yes, and, and thank you for um, acknowledging the reality that, that Verizon as a business has been working in this area for some time now. Um, from a policy perspective, we are working on common sense criminal justice reform. In fact, we seek out at both the state level and the federal level legislation that we can get behind in the criminal justice reform space. And we put our advocacy, our lobbying, our influence might behind that legislation. Um, it's so, you know, unless we change the laws and the policy, um, the criminal justice system has no chance of figuring out how to stop disproportionately and negatively impacting black and brown communities. And so we're very proud to have been doing this work uh, for some time. But Dr. G, I'll also share that we do so much more, right? In, in, in the volunteerism space, mm -hmm. um, our attorneys in Verizon are encouraged and do pro bono work uh, with organizations working in this space a, a, around the sealing and expungement of criminal records for the formerly incarcerated individuals. We are partnered with the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth to make sure that those youth sentences, which so oftentimes are so unfair for children, are not any longer, that they're fair and they make sense. All employees this recent election were encouraged to engage in a volunteer uh, way on voter education. We gave all of our employees a half day off on this recent election day to go vote or engage in facilitating the voting process for others. In the philanthropy space, Dr. G, our marquee program is Verizon Innovative Learning. And since 2012, 450,000 students in Title I schools hmm are getting the connections, the technology, and an immersive STEM curriculum. We've invested over $535 million in market value to STEM education. And yesterday we just expanded that program, um, uh, creating um, learning pathways for teachers so they can be the very best they can be in this all digital teaching environment that they're in, right? right. Dr. G, our business practices, we have the Verizon Distance Learning Program in direct response to the pandemic, which provides affordable internet connections and solutions to 38 million students across 40 states in the District of Columbia. And I'll just, I'll just wrap the examples by saying, I'm so proud to share that we have been in partnership with an African-American owned firm, a market equity firm called Loop Capital Markets. 
-hmm. And just this month, we worked in partnership with them on a $1.2 billion, mm -hmm. billion dollar mm -hmm. asset backed securities transaction. And in September, we worked with them on a $1 billion bond issuance focused on environmental sustainability. Dr. G, here's my point. This is what we call in Verizon allyship, using our corporate position and our influence and the work that we do to give rise to others. And all of these things I just went through in some form or fashion are doing that successfully. What we know in Verizon is our employees don't just come to work with us and get a paycheck. Investors don't just invest with us um, because we're a great stock to invest in. Customers just don't buy from us because we have world-class products and services. But we know that they do also because they recognize that we are a purpose-driven company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these issues that we're talking about are, at, at, are just as critical to our corporate business strategy as all the other things you would expect any other corporation to do. So we think that the two go hand in hand and they position us for long-term sustainable growth. So that's, that's why it's important to look at these things through the right lens and bring it into your, your core business strategy. That is so powerful. And, and just the idea of understanding that all of these areas have a great level of intersectionality. Yeah. And it is that intersectionality is what allows us to propel real strong policies long term. So as we wrap up, you know, we you mentioned voting. Uh, we cannot leave this conversation today um, at all without talking about the historic nature um, of the voting process that we just experienced. I often say in the company of women, magic happens and we have all kind of magic going on right now. <laughs> And given our nation's um, progress, uh, Black Americans in particular, you know, have made remarkable strides. And we have to recognize the extraordinary historic achievement of Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. You just have to sit in that for a second, mm -hmm. right? I just want you in our closing moments here to speak to what do you think it means to our generation as as leaders in our communities, as wives, as moms, to have her coming into the second highest office in our nation? What does it mean for our generation and for future generations of Black female leaders? Well, I guess I, I want to answer that question in the following way. And that is, when I was in my youth, um, I learned that an African-American woman by the name of Carolyn Mosley Braun was the first African-American woman elected to the United States Senate. And somewhere in my youth and, and, you know, in youth, we tend to be selfish. I sort of took a second to go, wait a minute, let me put the boy chasing and the partying and the fast fashion <laughs> stuff aside for a second <laughs> and think, wait a minute, I didn't know that could happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it caused me to reflect on what is my mom doing? Well, my mom is a trained architect and urban planner and worked in the profession her whole career. Well, that's pretty amazing too. It caused me to look at the other women in my life and figure out what they were doing. All because I learned about United States Senator Carolyn Mosley Braun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it caused me to go, well, what the heck am I going to do? <laughs> Right. And it, and it just like our CEO gave air cover for us to work on racial equity and racial justice. Carolyn Mosley Braun, as a member of the United States Senate, gave me the air cover to go, well, what the heck am I doing? And it freed me up to be bold and to be thoughtful about where I wanted to be. And frankly, Dr. G, that's part of the reason why I'm sitting here with you today. And so when I think of vice president elect, Kamala Harris as a biracial woman elected to the second highest office in the land. I know what that means for all the youth out there, the African-American girls, the Asian-American girls, women in general, young women in general who are going, wait a minute, that actually happened? That just happened? Yeah. What am I doing? That's the importance of it for me. And, and frankly, I'm inspired by her too. I mean, yeah. I'm in a, you know, I'm in a career that I've been in for a long time, but suddenly I feel like, well, what more can I be doing to be an example 
and be that shining, beaming light of hope for so many other young people. So it is so meaningful on so many levels. And I appreciate you asking me the question, but that, that is what it means to me, Dr. G. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to affirm for you that you are a bold, beaming light. Um, it has absolutely been my pleasure to have met you and engaged with you um, leading up to this moment. Um, and I just want to thank you for having tea with Dr. G, powered by Verizon in this time. Your investment in our Advocacy in Motion initiative, that's what we call this, um, enabled us to launch this series and advance our work to promote racial equity with thought leaders like yourself and across South Florida. So you are giving us platform to be able to engage so many more individuals um, around this race equity work. And for that, I and the Urban League will forever be grateful. So thank you. And I want everyone to stay tuned for more Tea with Dr. G. And we just appreciate you, Michelle, for being with us today. Thank you for having me.